rock music. Uh, I don't know. Where do you begin? Where do you end? Well, Is rock dead? <laughs> <laughs> you sound like the enemy. <laughs> Is rock dead? No, I thought I sounded like a Hollywood journalist. How would you, uh, what's the quickest way of catching AIDS in New York? Up the Hudson. <laughs> and uh, the lowest form of AIDS, rock's bottom. <laughs> oh. But uh, I'm sure Australia's familiar with uh, AIDS jokes. Last time we were in Australia, in fact, the only time, the herp was uh, rife in Sydney. In the bay there, there was a lot of hair going around. <laughs> is that what the well, mark is on your lip? Uh, what mark? <laughs> <laughs> what lip? I haven't got any lips anymore, it's all hair. <laughs> Crawling hair, we call it. Over here. No, it was, it was like a... You had to put toilet paper on the seat over there in Australia. I heard it. The percentage was something high in climbing. Did you uh, enjoy it? What? Hep? <laughs> no, Australia. Australia. Um, Australia. I did, actually. In fact, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> the other three did. I enjoyed it, but it wasn't the best place I've ever been to because it probably was, and I didn't even know it. That's how stupid I am. I didn't even realise that Australia was the centre of the world. But now, in retrospect, I understand. Hang on, I'll just fix your wires out. I couldn't read all of the sunny thing on your tape recorder there. Um, now, th when we went to Australia last time, it was after a month in America, so... and then a week in New Zealand. So by that time, I was going round the bend. And... Uh, I was a bit, I didn't know who I was, where I was, <laughs> and why, you know. I kept saying to people why, and they didn't, they just keep giving me fosters. <laughs> and uh, I'm a bit bevied now, actually. I've had a few, a few tubes today. And uh, it was really nice, but it was... It was the fly season. A lot of flies on Sydney Bay. I just remember the the last impression I have of Australia is walking down the that road by Bondi Beach to the hotel. I just went for a meal in some dodgy restaurant. Well, it wasn't even a restaurant. It was a cafe. Caf, we call them. And there were flies everywhere. Flies on me sodding tuna fish flies in the salad and God knows what else and then I thought that's fair enough and uh, I thought I'll pay for this so they may I, I don't care is this going out on radio <laughs> <laughs> and then I walked I came out the southern building and I was walking down the road and it was flies everywhere I couldn't see through the flies like and that was my lasting impression of Australia the flies <laughs> yeah and if you get rid of them, it's a great place. I just have this phobia about flies. A phobia, I call it. Does it about bother flies. you in your dreams? Nah. <laughs> I, you... I always end up sticky. <laughs> <laughs> it takes ages. I have to sit in the sodden washing machine with the duvet. And we become disentangled. How's Lorraine? She's fine. <laughs> she has to get in the washing machine as well. Now, edit all that. I didn't know he knew. <laughs> Are you yeah. gonna... Sorry. Are you going to have any children? I hope so. Soon? But I d I'm not sure if I'm capable. <laughs> I'll... Never mind culpable. I love that word, culpable. I just thought I'd throw it in. I may be capable, <laughs> but uh, will you be going back to Australia ever? 
Well, in order to get to Australia, you have to go back, don't you? It's sort of, I don't, oh, oh, the microphone's just fallen over. Uh, I, when we went there to Australasia, I did think that it was a bit like going back in time, and it was like, it was a weird place. But I liked it, you know, I'm really glad I went. And I like New Zealand as well. I'm getting serious here, folks, because <laughs> we've got an album coming out. Oh, I managed to get the uh, the pull ring in between all these balls here. I never thought I'd do. Um, this will make interesting listening, won't it? <laughs> it sure will. <laughs> but I I'm... think interviews should be the way. We just did an interview before for video, some European video channel, cable TV. And I was just being natural, bevied, you know. And Pete was falling asleep at the side of me. And I was just waffling on, talking any rubbish, you know. But that was how I felt at that minute. And they were all freaking out because it wasn't what they wanted, you know. They wanted concise answers, like, to questions, things that made sense, you know. And I said, I left saying, you'll look back on this interview and think it was a classic. It was like all our history has been dogged by people saying, like not understanding what we were on about, whether it was musically or in interviews or appearance-wise, whatever. They'd say, oh, you know, if only you could uh, be a bit more how we want you to be. And, it, you know, who wants to listen to that crap? So you'd say you're fairly strong-willed, all of you? Yeah, we are up to a certain point and then the bevy takes over and then it doesn't matter how strong-willed you are, you know. But I think that's good, it's like honest, you know. I don't want to come across in an interview. If I'm bevied, I don't want to come across sober. If I'm sober, I want to come across bevied. And there's the problem. You have a duality to your uh, personality, then? <laughs> no. Or possibly, yes. A singularity, is that the other... If I have a duality, can I have a singularity? <laughs> Please. I don't know. What is the singular of duality? A pair. Pardon? <laughs> Two? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just think... Uh, I think you've got to come across however you are at that given moment in time. You don't think perhaps you might regret it later? Oh, probably, yeah. But as long as I don't say anything too controversial that might offend anyone. I don't think I can offend anyone by saying I'm bevied or talking utter gibberish, but if I say I dislike something or someone, I can maybe offend someone then. So I'm, I'm never going to say that I dislike anyone ever again. Except flies, because they don't listen to the radio. Or maybe they do, maybe flies sit on the wall listening to the radio and uh, what you say, and then they decide to go and crap on your head. <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm sh I think animals and insects have probably got a higher intelligence than we are. And I'm sure, I know that I've got a cat at home, me and Lorraine have got a cat, and I know it speaks English better than I can, because the other day I was saying to her, her name is Polly, and I kept saying to her, Polly, and a tail had wag, and it would do this sort of weird little tail wag every time I said Polly, but if I said cardboard, there, there wasn't a, a flutter out of that tail. And every time I said Polly, and I said, listen Polly, I know that you understand me and that you can speak English. And probably every other language going, probably ancient Latin, and uh, well, Greek or whatever, you know, whatever language it was going around then, ancient Hebrew. And she just looked at me, and I just felt really stupid because I'd been talking to my cat, and it was more intelligent than I was. And she just looked at me and said, said with her eyes, really, listen. You know that I know that I can speak all these languages, but
but you know, I'd seen her look out the window <laughs> and uh, hiss at other cats. And that's, you know, I think that says a lot about a lot of things. Does it say a lot about you? Yeah. Because I can only speak one language, I can speak a bit of Spanish. And uh, I know how to ask for the right things in French. But uh, so it's probably cats, you know, they're, just, they're the best animal in the world. Best thing. I'd love to be a cat. Really? So would uh, Robert Smith. I'd have a cure. He said he'd like to be a cat. Yeah, he's probably got the uh, hair for it. No, I love Robert. Robert, if you're listening, if you're ever in Australia and you tune into this station and you're listening, let's do a single together. I'd love to do a single with Robert Smith. I haven't told him yet. I'm planning to, and I know that we're his favourite group. But I'm sure he only really likes us because I'm in them. And uh, me and Robert would be great. Bob and Ian. Ian and Bob. I don't... He, his name can come first, but I've heard he's big in France. Very. Yeah, very big. And, like, you earn a lot of sodding cash over there. So, Bob, if you're listening, me and you do a single... I'll write the words because I've heard you have problems writing lyrics. You can write the music. We can sit down, listen to uh, what was that new order last album? There's a lot of good stuff you can rip off from that album. When you order, rip the Cure off there. Yeah, but who didn't? They all ripped us off anyway in the sudden beginning. So you know we should have. I should. You know me, Will, Les, and Pete should be getting a lot more cash than we're getting. Because we wrote everything since 1978 or nine. We've written everything, really. But I mean, you didn't write September song, did you? No, but that, I don't count that as being since 1978 or nine. That was 19 whatever it was. Every song that has been written since 1978 or 79, say 79, we have written in effect. Was that controversial? That's pretty controversial. Yeah, well, I didn't really mean it. But uh, we have influenced a lot of Southern people. But me and Robert Smith, we could do this great song. A bit like In Between Days, like that kind of... You know, that kind of bass riff, chugging away. I'll write the lyrics, and me and him could sing like... He could sing the first verse. If he's big in France, if they hear his voice on the first verse then they'll rush out and buy it. I'll sing the chorus, maybe with his voice in there as well. And then I'll sing the next verse. Yeah, you know, we could do it easy, and it'd be a smash. Who would you get to do the video for it? Tim Bogue. Have you seen the latest Cure video? Anton Corbin can take the photo. <laughs> no, I haven't, but I've heard about it. Just hearing about it sounds great. Just that somebody said, you know, well, I don't know if you said that about a Books Fizz video or you'd think, oh, that looks, that seems a bit weird. But when you know that the Cure are doing it and they're sitting in a wardrobe, it just makes sense with the Cure, I think. I think if we did a video like that, we'd look too embarrassed or self-conscious. I mean, I think he does as well, but he's even more bevied than I am usually. That's what I like about him. I'd love to go out for a night with Robert Smith. You wouldn't get anywhere, you'd just sit, sit in one place and get completely drunk in your yeah, in mobile. Well, yeah, probably. But I met him once with Lorraine in Liverpool. We went backstage and, like, because Lorraine's always liked the cure. She always liked his voice and stuff. I used to hate his voice. But he ju his voice now just seems to hold this mystery for me that I never used to think. It's because the songs have changed, I think. And, uh before it was all like real doomy, dirty. It used to annoy me, but now it's like when he's singing, and we are in between with her, yeah, and just like a kid of five singing it, you know, it's like real. How we can manage to sound that innocent, I don't know. It's like, I think he's a real. Not a genius or anything, but I think he. The Cure and us, I think, are the only two groups left now that are doing anything 
from that period, like there might be new groups coming up. I like Jesus and Mary saying that, just like Honey stuff or thing, but the album's a bit iffy, don't you think? Yeah. Definitely, yeah. What about the Banshees? I've always liked them in patches, you know, but I just think it's too much, it's juju this, juju that. It's all a load of juju, you know. It's, uh, it's like a. Uh, it's like the brat at school when you're about ten years old and there's a girl who like writes on the wall or writes on your face or something. And that's Susie to me. You know. She's heard that she's heard of pumpkins or something. And she bases her whole life around pumpkins and Halloween. And I think there's more to life than Halloween. But Robert Smith he's you know he's like a kindred spirit, I think. You don't think you'd do a cover version of somebody else's song or, or an old classic? You'd rather write something of your own, would you? I'd like to do an Abba song one day. Maybe a Jacques Brel song. But uh, I want to do a Jacques Brel musical one day. And I'll play Jacques Brel, obviously. And write a few songs of my own. Just I, I think it's like a real good play come musical in the Jack Brown thing. I think it could be real Yeah, all that sudden scene of like Paris and that European thing of like fifties and early sixties where it was like all black and white and it was all stone ceilings and walls and you could write some great songs around that and use some of Jack Brown stuff, maybe some PF stuff. And it, it all makes sense. I really want to do that. So do you, do you think of yourself as like uh, being British or European or does your nationality, does that <coughs> enter into it or, a lot? Or not? Do you think about that? I do sometimes. I always think, I mean, first and foremost, I think I'm a Liverpoolian. But I've been in the press lately in Liverpool and me saying that Liverpool's the biggest shit all on God's earth, which I said because I've just been burgled for uh, the umpteenth time and uh, it all blew up out of proportion I've spent like seven years saying Liverpool's the best place in the world and, and then I said one one interview where I said I hate it because I, I keep getting burgled you know so it was an obvious reaction but apart from that I do think of myself as being from Liverpool but I love like Europe I, I think Britain is great for what it is, but it's only great in that. It's all like colloquial, and I mean, I hate people when they say I'm British, you know, or I'm from Liverpool, and you know, smack, smack, smack. But I do the same thing. I always say, like when I'm in France and somebody's looking at me a bit strange, and I just think. Southern Liverpool don't look at me like that and as much as I do think like that I do think Europe I feel more European I love being in France, Holland, Belgium Germany, Switzerland any southern place even Scandinavia as well I just love it over there I think Europe's like the key to Europe is the centre of the world I think You've got a new record out, haven't you? Have we? I don't like talking about new records. Did, did you have um, a decent say in what songs went on it, or some of them on there make you go sort of, yeah? What, the singles album? Mm. Well, by... It's a singles album, so you have to... The puppet, I never thought, was the greatest thing we ever recorded. I like the... I practice my fall for practice makes perfect. I like that opening line. But some of the lyrics are a bit cringe, City. I like with the salt of the earth and we know what to say. With the salt of the earth and we know our place. Because it was like with that verse um this is a little diversion, but uh there's that thing about <coughs> that element in working class ism where people go with the salt of the earth and we know what to say. But at the same time, the following line is with the salt of the earth and we know our place. 
And it's like the two go hand in hand. They're always saying, I mean, I'm working class, but a lot of them are always saying, you know, this is what we are. But by saying that, puts you in a certain bracket anyway, you know, it's like, and we know our place, it's like we can never aspire to anything beyond this because we've got all this bigotry that is involved with being working class, you know, you can't like this, you can't like that, you can't like fellas in ballet tights, you know, I just think, this, I feel really working class, but I don't, and I suppose I'm as bigoted as anyone. But that's just one song anyway, and I think that's worth being on the album for that couplet. Uh, but I think that's the only track that I thought was substandard on that album, for the time that we were doing it in, anyway. At the time, I mean, I think the puppet's good anyway, but it's it doesn't compare with Rescue or, you know, The Cutter, I suppose. Risky. And the Killer Moon is like I think the Killer Moon should be one album on its own. I think so. I heard it the other night. It's just the best song I've heard for. I don't know. I do think that with that we created something that was beyond even us. You know, I think it. I really feel humble Give after me. it writing. Well, being part of writing it. Although I did write the chords and I wrote the lyrics. I didn't write the lead guitar solo bit, but you know. So with that one you'd say that Will's in the next room, he might object if he hears me. Sorry. <laughs> On that one you'd say that uh, the, s the sum of the parts is like greater than just well, I think that is true on most of our stuff anyway. We've always been a group that have believed in that, even if we've never understood that maxim. We've always uh, believed in it. But, I mean, maxims like that, they're just things that you believe in without ever understanding. It's like a sudden riddle, you know, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. It is one of those things that... If you think about it for half an hour, you think, oh, yeah, I understand what that means. And then a second later, you think, some of the parts is greater than the whole. I mean, what's more important? that You get into all the sudden objective and subjective views on what should be the greatest part, whether it should be... I don't know. I don't know if you know what I mean, but I think things like that are designed. Somebody invented the phrase like the sum of the parts being greater than the whole to make some sense out of something. But it always confuses me. I know what it means, and I think that's what the bunny men are based on, or not that actual phrase, but that philosophy. But uh, it does confuse me sometimes that actual phrase. So if, if somebody... It's like to be or not to be, that is the question. What's that supposed to mean, you know? That's what I mean, it's up to the individual. Like, at one moment in your life you can think, I know what he means by that. It's like with a lot of my lyrics, people can think, oh, I know what he meant by that. And then a, a second later, it's gone. It's the same with me when I think about my lyrics. I know what I've written, and I think, Great, you know, and then a month later I can think, what the sod was I on about there, you know? That it, is the sod in... That doesn't sort of... That doesn't worry you at all? That you, you don't sort of understand uh, what you might have written, even though you, you did understand it when you wrote it? It doesn't worry me, I mean... No, it doesn't worry me be, because I can't... It's like... Huh? If, well, yeah, I'll get on. some more. We can turn the tape off and... Uh, well, not finish, finish, but finish this. It doesn't worry me... If I can't figure out what the meaning of life is, 
sometimes I think I have figured it out and then it passes by and I think something else. If I feel like that about the meaning of life, then why should the lyric that I've written bother me, you know? It's not that big. I mean, I think a lot of the lyrics I write are sort of dealing with that thing anyway, you know, what... It sounds sort of pompous and stupid, but all that thing about why do I feel this when I also feel the total opposite at the same time. And I think that's part of the mystery. It's not something that I, I feel I need answering for myself. You know? I don't really want to... I don't think anybody does. You know? I think that's why religions like was invented. It, it's for people who don't know what the sod they're talking about, really. But it doesn't matter, you know. I think quizzes are always popular, you know, like... things that people don't understand are always popular. It tests your brain and... When I do a crossword and the answers are on page 43, always try not to look at the answers, you know. Only at the, <laughs> <laughs> the last resort will be looking at, you know, 21 across, I'll think, oh, if I can get that, I'll pull that in and then I'll work out the rest from there. You know, I think it is always like that challenge with people that makes them feel it's all worthwhile. Anyway, I've got to have a slash, I'm dying. We could just talk about whatever we feel like. What's ah, the most it's a Zenizer, this mic. I like Zenizer. <laughs> What's the most unusual way? You like Budweiser? Yeah, I can. You Why'd remind that? me of someone. Yeah? Who? Hey. I don't know. Somebody in Liverpool? No, nah, somebody in uh, Bluey. What? Have you finished? No, we're still sodding <laughs> the tape rabbit. is rolling. I've just had a... I went in for a slash. Got unavoidably detained, didn't I? With Rob Dickens, Chairman Dickens. I can't keep away from him. Oh, well, Gaz is downstairs. Who? Gaz. Who's Gaz? Music box did the interview. Oh, is he? All oh, right, we'll have to go with the pub in a minute. Let's just, uh Finish that, and then... Go yeah, definitely wait for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's expensive here, isn't it? It is, but it's probably better. You are talking about the cost of living. Of course, yeah. of course. Well, the cost of living over there, it's usually about £60, isn't it? What's the cost of living in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, what's the cost of living, you know, sterling in Australia? Well, at the moment, the Australian dollar is really, really sick. I mean, it's... it's... I'm not talking FT index here. I'm talking about the cost of living. I cost said £60 over here. And you know what it'd I'm be, talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, It'd be... 100 bucks? 100 dollars, which I'm is like, yeah, 40, 45 pounds. For the, for the cost of living? Yeah. Shit. Lots of sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it costs about a tenner, doesn't it, to get a surfboard? <laughs> They're more expensive over there. Anyway. I'm sure we can't use this on daytime. <laughs> oh, that, no, that was South African. Have you ever been to South Africa? No. <laughs> Would you ever? Never. What about uh, your records? Are you happy to have your records to be sold there? Yeah, I said today to someone, because I hadn't even thought... Not in a million years would I think that we'd sell a re one record in South Africa. But I said to somebody today, it was Anne-Marie, but she's not the person to speak to, she should speak to Rob. But I said I'd like, you know, because I read that some other group had done it and I hadn't even thought about it, you know. You don't really think about that when you're trying to... When you're married and you've got a cat to feed and you're watching the telly. <laughs> All those sort of complicated things in life. But uh, some group I read the other day give all the royalties from South African record sales to anti-apartheid. That's Blumange. Is it Blumange? Yeah, Blumange too. Yeah, and I just said, I think we should do that, and could you get on the case about it? Because I do believe that. But 
You feel so, I mean, it's like if you sell 10 records in South Africa, you feel like you're doing nothing. Um, well, Elvis Costello's got it written into his contract that his records aren't to be released in South Africa. He's got, he's got a clause in his but contract. But I think that's like so, then, so naive and uh, it's as bigoted as the country is, you know. There's a lot of people there who aren't like that, you know. You only have to read letters being sent into pop magazines and the enemy or whatever. They're not all like that. You can't deny people. It's like saying we were the British Empire, you know. Who we are we to sort of talk? I just think it's all like politics is so sort of naive, you know. I, I stay clear of it whenever I can because I think people who politicians are as thick as pig shit anyway and people who in music who can't even write a good song not Elvis Costello he's you know obviously talented and everything but there are people in music who start commenting on politics you know they don't even know the first thing about music never mind politics and it's better to just if you're going to do something just do it and do it anonymously don't pretend you know anything about things I find all that, that thing in pop music, because that's what it is, pop music, I think it just gets out of hand. It's like, I don't want, when I was a kid, buying pop records or rock records, I didn't want Sodden Bowie to be spouting on about, you know, the GLC or whatever, I wanted him to be a hero. I think that's what pop music's all about. He can do whatever he wants anonymously and he can put whatever money he makes into certain organisations and charitable funds and everything. But I want him to be a hero more than anything. And I think with pop music, you're dealing with 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds, basically. That's when I was into the Velvets, I was 13 and Bowie I was 13 and I didn't I just wanted them to be gods you know and I think that's what they should be they shouldn't be trying to win affection through all you know all that life I think it was like trying to, they're not content with being number one they want to be sort of in, respected in some strange way a political way would you have done live out if you were asked I don't think so, no. I thought it was all a bit dubious. I mean, Frankie goes to Hollywood. They were the biggest group at the time. Yeah, only um, in Britain, though. Only in Britain, yeah. But, I mean, they were the biggest sensation, and they never did it, you know. I just think... It was all a bit dubious. It was like people doing it for reasons that... <coughs> when... Yeah, so at least Freddie Mercury said, we did it because we'd have been... We wanted to get out to over a billion people. And I think that was why they did it, you know. I'm sure Bowie thought that he was doing it for a good reason, but it was like an event that you'd have... We'd have, because we're perverse anyway, we'd have missed out on it, whether we'd have been a big group or not. It's. I just think it's all misinformed and misguided. Do you enjoy being perverse? Yeah. Mm. I wish a few more groups were. It's just, it gets so sudden boring. You're out there on a limb, or what you think. It's not even that much of a limb. But because nobody else is perverse, they're all into appealing to every generation of the record buying public it's so oh, that is perverse to me to sort of gear what you do to appeal to all these people that you wouldn't spend five minutes with in a pub you know and that's what I find really weird and just I can't understand it like the reason for writing music is initially to annoy all those people it's like what are you rebelling against? What have you got? You know, it's like that has always got to be part of it. And I mean, we don't rebel, but because we're so annoyingly boring a lot of the time, 
All these... I mean, we're even bored into old age pensioners. Old age pensioners would much sooner listen to Shaking Stevens and people, you know. And we come on and go boom, boom, boom. And that is like rebellion to me. All these grandmothers who are into sodding, even Frankie goes to Hollywood, they find that like they can go. And like we come on. And that's what I like. I think that's part of why you write music when you're young, to annoy. But what about bring on the dancing horses? People could tap along to that, couldn't they? But it's stiff at number 21. Even the cults have got higher than that. And they've got nothing going for them at all, you know. The cults have got higher than Echo and the Bunny Man, and that is like, to me, it's, a, it's sacrilege. But... I find it funny anyway, you know, it's like we're so boring, even when we do something that's commercial. It's so boring. <laughs> no real fire. I think it could be Peter Fraser. But it's not. Um, I don't know, you know, it's like, it's one of those things. Bring on the Dancing Horses was just a song we wrote with a nice tune. And it, we made it so nice and sickly that even grandmothers couldn't bear the taste of it you know? but I think that's part of it, it was perverse we are perverse but not that perverse I mean seven up is a bit much where's the most unusual place you've ever had six? oh god Um <sighs> probably in Australia <laughs> no sorry that was a joke Um I don't know, I can't. there's a lot at stake here, you know what I mean? <laughs> when I was younger, when I was younger, when I was younger, what, what's the next one? That's when I was so much younger, younger than today. That was help, the Beatles. Yeah, and I was, when I was younger, so much younger, when I was younger, so much younger than today. Never thought I needed anybody's help in any way. Yeah, the, it was probably outside the lift. It wasn't in a lift, but it was outside on. Bootle in Liverpool, that was pretty unusual. Uh, probably, you know, innumerable places, but I'd rather you edit them out. Um, unusual. I could be play safe and say Liverpool. Nah, you know, quite a few places, really. They're all fairly unusual. Depends. Have you ever Let me ask you a question. Yeah. What's your favourite position? Sexually. On my back. On your back? Mm. Really? Mm. And what's the girl doing? I presume it's girl. <laughs> <laughs> Do I presume too much? No, you don't. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Good, especially after all them rock huts and jokes. On with her sort of sitting up rather than getting too familiar. Yeah. Well this I think all you listeners should know. Are you are you quite well known? Do you have a regular show? Well I think they should know, you know. Just think you might meet a girl in a few weeks' time and she'll say, Oh yeah, they your favourite position's on your back and she'll say, Mine is to and, uh, you know, she'll do the business with you. <laughs> but I think if you're on your back, they should be at least upright. If you're doing your sodding best after a hard night's boozing to be upright, they should, you know. <coughs> and, uh, but <laughs> that is my favourite. What's yours? Well, sounds a bit crude. But, uh... It's sort of, <laughs> sort of from behind, you know. Yeah, the truth will out, as they say. But it is, you know. Hello, Australia. Um, it is, but whether we use this or not <laughs> is neither here nor there. Have you ever met uh, any of your... Heroes, like Bowie or anybody like that? I met Leonard Cohen in Dublin. 
No, I didn't. I went. Th he did a tour in Britain. He played two London shows, one Birmingham, one Manchester, and then two in Dublin. And I went to the first two, the two London shows. He only did two, and uh, I loved it. And I had backstage passes and everything, and I couldn't go backstage. And it was with Lorraine. I said to Lorraine, "We've got to go on all of this tour. We've got to follow him." Then we went to Birmingham, and it was brilliant. Like, and I thought, you know, this is it. And then he played Manchester, and we didn't go to Manchester because we we hadn't been home since Birmingham. We went to London, and we were kipping in people's houses and stuff. And then we gave Manchester a mess, and apparently that was brilliant, the Manchester show. And we stayed that night in Liverpool and got the plane over to Dublin because he was doing two shows in Dublin. And I, I phoned up my the agent that I used and said, find out what hotel he's in because I want to stay in the same hotel. Because he's like my all-time hero, Benny Cohen. And uh, we'd been bevying, like we got there about 11 o'clock in the morning, and we started bevying on the Guinness. I was sitting there with Lorraine, like, I was pissed. And uh, Lorraine was drinking Perrier or something. And uh, she said, oh, Lenny Cohen's behind you, Ian. And I went. And I turned around, Lenny Cohen was, like, standing about 15 yards away, and I was crapping myself, you know. And I just sat there and I finished me pint, and I didn't say anything. And then he cleared off Lenny Cohen. And uh, later that night, I was still on the Guinness. I, I was totally drunk. And uh, there was a rugby show on. A rugby show. <laughs> you Australians are like that. Or New Zealand. Now, there was a rugby match on in Dublin. It was like Ireland v... I think it was the All Blacks, maybe. And uh, it was packed, the whole hotel. Everybody drinking Guinness. And if they weren't drinking Guinness, they were sort of in puffs. And uh, all the puffs went off to see the rugby match anyway. Rugby's big down under, isn't it? Oh, yeah, the bar was so crowded full of sudden Irish people and New Zealanders or whatever they were. Oh, no, it was Ireland v France, I think. Yeah, it was France. But it was a big, important match. Grand Slam and all that, or whatever they call it. Is that what they call it? Yeah. And uh, I was sitting there, I was talking to Elvis Costello because he was in, he came down to the hotel talking, you know, we were having a gab and stuff. And uh, I was talking away to Elvis Costello like he was the fella next door. And then Lenny Cohen swept through this foyer and into the bar. And he looked about a hundred years old, but I'm talking to Australia now. <laughs> I feel as though I'm saying something important. Swept through this bar with like the weight of the world on his shoulders, and his suit hadn't been ironed in about ten years. His suit was disgusting. And uh, <coughs> Lorraine said to me, Lenny Combs just walked through into the bar, and I said, I know, I know. And I was sitting there with a pint of Guinness in my hand, quaking. I was like, I was, I was like that. And I said to Lorraine and Elvis Costello, I said, listen, I've just got to go and follow him. And he walked into the bar and I followed him into the bar. And I had me pint in my hand, <laughs> as you would have. And he looked lost, he looked like he didn't know anyone in the world. And I tapped him on the shoulder, because he, he had his back to me. And he was looking for someone or something. And I tapped him on the shoulder and he turned around. And uh, I said, hello. And he went, hi. And like, I shook hands with him and I was like trembling in my shoes. It, I'd never felt like that, ever. Even at the most, <clears throat> when I was at school, when I was at my most embarrassed and nervous, I never felt like that. And he was facing me this like, God, you know, and uh, I said, I just had to say hello to you, and he said, wow, hello, and, and I couldn't think of anything, and I'd brought over a copy of Ocean Rain that was already shrink-wrapped, it had the cellophane around the outside, and I just said, I want to give you this, 
And he looked at it and said, oh, Echo and the Bunny. He said, do you have anything to do with Echo and the Bunny? I said, yeah, I'm the singer. And uh, he said, oh, I've heard so much about you. He said, people tell me that you're great, that you're a great writer and everything. I said, oh. <laughs> and I was, like, so embarrassed. And I said, well, I just think, I said, I think you're great. I wasn't, I didn't care what he thought about Echo and the Bunny Man. I just said, I think you're great, you know. And uh, that was it, and we shook hands, and I'd never, even if I met David Bowie, I wouldn't feel like that. It was like Lenny Cohn was, it was like meeting. Lenny Cohn has never let me down, ever. And, uh, even when he writes songs that I don't like, he's never let me down. Bowie, he hasn't let me down because Bowie, anybody is entitled to do what they do, but Bowie has disappointed me. But Lenny Cohen has never disappointed me. And I think that's like a true hero. So how do you feel about people that have got you as their hero? Well, I hope that I never let them down or disappoint them. I'd... I mean, that's why... Maybe I go over the top sometimes, I'd say, oh, I'm buried and pissed, you know, and just so that they never, I want them never to think that I'm a, a person that can never get pissed, you know, I don't want to be, I know that when I was 13, one of the greatest things that Bowie ever gave me was this thing of him, I used to put his pictures on my wall all over my bedroom, and I used to think he was from Mars or somewhere. And I thought, don't you ever let me see that you're from air. And then one day it clicked that he was just a fella, you know. And that was as big a disappointment as when I first saw him and I thought, God, this person is just what I've been waiting for all my life. He's, he's from Mars and... But as soon as you think that about someone, there's going to be one day when you reach 15 or whatever that you realise he's from Beckenham in England. And Lenny Cohen to me was always from Canada. Canada's a lot more mysterious than Mars anyway, you know? Because people live in Canada and people live in England and Australia and it's people that are mysterious, not Mars or... Whatever. Hold that tape. Okay.